Oh, the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. got one announcement before Dennis does our announcements. Uh, we wanted to thank, all the ladies wanted to thank Dennis and Joel for everything they've done yesterday. So I just want to tell everybody thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate it. We did get to eat for free. <laughs> I just have a couple of announcements this morning uh, that uh, need to be aware of uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock is the memorial service for Brother Ted Rush at the Woodruff Congregation there in Woodruff. Um, if you can be there, uh, that would be great. Um, Ted will be greatly missed. He was a tremendous evangelist. Um, Diane Foster will be having dental surgery this Thursday, so please keep her in our prayers. Um, Try to avoid those people by like the plague. Their dentist, uh, <laughs> if they say painless dental surgery, they lie. <laughs> um, Sister Sandra Damaris called to say that uh, her and her husband are under the care of a doctor that actually comes to their house. Uh, her and Bobby are suffering from severe sinus infections right now. Uh, their daughter, Carla Burns, was flown by helicopter from Lawrence Hospital to Greenville Memorial. She had been bleeding internally, and uh, she is there. She's had her spleen removed, um, and she's requesting prayers for all of them. And so we need to keep them in our prayers. Our sympathies go out to the family of Peter Schofield. Uh, they were members here for a short time. Uh, he had passed away June 24th after having a stroke. Uh, his wife, Deborah, uh, is probably dealing and having a very difficult time, as Roger Goodwin's sister, Deborah, is. And uh, so please keep them in your prayers. And uh, the funeral will be sometime this week, but we don't have that. Uh, Harry Smith's wife, Deborah, has been in the ICU in Greenville Memorial. Uh, she has had to have uh, some major surgery. She was supposed to be out of uh the ICU Friday. And so, uh, but Harry had not been able to go see her up until this point. Hopefully that has had is no idea when she will be able to um, be released. She had her colon removed. And so uh, uh, you'll notice that if you'll remember, she's also had her legs removed, amputated uh, a few years back because of her diabetes. Uh, so please keep her and Harry in your prayers as they really need it. Uh, we've had one lesson down from Brother Ferris Austin, uh, uh, beginning of our gospel meeting this morning, very informative, a very good lesson, looking forward to the next four lessons uh, that he will be delivering to us. Um, I could read Ferris's biography, but then we'd be having the invitation and leaving. Um, just his education level, uh, I'm just glad I don't have to call him doctor, uh, but he is uh, very, uh, very well educated. Uh, an elder at the University Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama, there at Faulkner University. He was also an elder there at North Charleston where uh, we became very acquainted with Ferris and Margie. Uh, Margie had some really, really good lessons yesterday at Ladies' Day. Um, to me, a huge success. And the ladies that plan these things, uh, uh, they really do a very good job at planning. And, and we're just so grateful to have Ferris and, and Margie in our presence. Uh, Ferris will be up and, and speaking again uh, uh, in just a, a little bit. Uh, so we pray that you will be able to come back. Uh, we are blessed with opportunities to 
It's just a matter of taking, grabbing hold of those opportunities. And uh, the more we are together, the better we are, always. Um, at this time uh, in our services, uh, this morning I will in just a moment have the opening prayer. Um, scripture reading be by Rusty Maddox this morning. Vernon Johnson will have our closing prayer. So if you will, bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so blessed with the opportunities that you have given us to be here this morning and to begin this new week and on the right foot to be able to come together to give you the honor and glory and, and the worship you so richly deserve uh, we are just mindful lord of, of the problems that we face on a daily basis we truly need one another and we're just thankful uh, that we have each other to lean on to rely on and to be able to uh, share our burdens and our joys together but we're just so grateful for good Christian people like Ferris and Margie who who spend their life as servants of you and and we're just grateful for the work that they have done and for the many lives that they have touched and we pray that you'll be with Ferris now as he uh, begins our gospel meeting uh, that those things that he imparts on us, Lord, that we will be able to, to use these things, Lord, to, to better share your word with others or in need. We're just grateful that you give us the life and breath that you give us and that you give us this one opportunity on this earth to live our lives, to obey your commands, and to worship and honor you always with the very lives that we lead. We pray for your strength, that you can give us to be able to overcome the things that we face. We are thankful, so thankful, Lord, that your son came on this earth, that we can be reconciled to you, and that through his blood, that everyone on this earth has the opportunity of eternal life. And we pray, Lord, that we will reach as many as we can, that we can share the blessings that we have received. We pray for our nation, for the divisiveness that it's going through at this time. We pray, Lord, that we will be able to overcome these things, to regain that nation at peace, that we can live our lives the way we deem necessary in accordance with your will. We pray for our leadership. We pray for those who are making our laws, that they will be just, that they will not hinder our ability to be able to gather together to worship you the way the Bible teaches us to. We're just grateful, Lord, that even though we may face this tyranny, that you are always there with us. Give us the strength always, Lord, to uphold your truths and never win. We pray that you'll forgive us when we fall short of the expectations you have for us. Pray that you'll forgive them and help us to overcome them. Give us the strength always to live this life. We look forward so much to the next. With our prayer, Lord, we pray that you'll send your son quickly and bring us all home together. Yes, these things in your son Jesus' name. Stop! 
as we gather around the table this morning to take the bread and the fruit of the vine, we do this in remembrance of Christ. In Acts 20 and 7, he tells us that we do this upon the first day of the week. If you would, if you take your hymn book, I'm going to read from it. It's uh, 3.30, it's what I'm going to read. It's in remembrance. It says, On this Lord's day we assemble round the table of the Lord. Happy hearts are made to tremble when we hear his blessed word. We recall his broken body as we look upon his this bread. Give you thanks, divide, and eat it in my memory, he said. And this crimson cup reminds us of that dreaded scene long ago when he died in pain and anguish. There his blood was made to flow. There in agony he suffered on the cross for you and me. Now upon the throne he reigns, blessed Lamb of Calvary. Thanks to God, such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for this exalted favor, blessed memorial of his love. We'll now have the prayer for the bread. The gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we partake of this Lord's Supper, we partake of the bread that represents Christ's body. We pray this when we do so in a manner well pleasing to thee. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll continue prayer for the fruit of the vine. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we continue this memorial service, we pray that we'll keep our thoughts focused on Christ as he suffered and bled and died in our stead. As we prepare to partake of this cup, may we partake in a manner that we find pleasing. In Christ's name we pray.
That concludes the Lord's <coughs> Supper. Another part of our worship service is given back to the Lord as He's commanded each one of us. If you would, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures. I'll read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. And it reads, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered, that there be no gatherings when I come. Well, now how the prayer for Oh, God, Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the this opportunity that we have to give back a portion which has given unto us. Let us all do this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Seven zero. Seven zero. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou my heavenward, O Father of my power.
This morning comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. That's Luke chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. And I am reading from the New American Standard Version. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him.
computers are a wonderful thing when they work well. As I said this morning in the Bible class, it's a pleasure for Margie and I to be here with all of you. We appreciate you so much. If we're good things about the congregation, and I know there are good things that you've got planned for the Lord. I know you want to be busy in the Lord's work, and that's good. That's what we all need to be doing. This morning I brought forth some artifacts and explained some of them, how they illustrate, of course, Biblical artifacts illustrating the Bible. It illustrates, uh, makes the Bible come alive. This morning I want to talk about Hezekiah. Now, you can turn to 2 Chronicles 32, 28, uh, 2 through 8, and, and you can see what's going on there. You know, but Hezekiah is an interesting individual. Hezekiah, uh, remember, uh, there's a little historical background here. After, of course, they, um, Hezekiah, there's a dividing of the land, dividing of the nation of Israel into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And after King Solomon, God sent prophet after prophet to warn them to turn from their sinful ways and follow him. However, all these warnings fell on deaf ears. All of the 19 kings who reigned in the northern kingdom of Israel did not follow the Lord, and they acted very wickedly. You can read that. You can see that. So as a result of all of this, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered and taken into captivity, 722 B.C., by the Assyrians, because of Israel's continued disobedience. Now, the Assyrians were the baddest of the bad. They were the most horrible nation. They were the most cruel. The Assyrians are also ones that uh, uh, were responsible here of, of, of attacking nations, ripping babies from pregnant mothers, uh, flaying, skinning, if you would please, males, hanging them on the walls of whatever city they might be in. Very cruel. And second, uh, excuse me, Kings 18, beginning in verse 11. <coughs> excuse me. Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away into exile to Assyria and put them, of course, in, uh, near the river of Gaza. And in the cities of Medes, verse 12, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenants, even all that Moses, the servants of the Lord, commanded, they would neither listen nor do what he had commanded. And the Assyrian army was brutal, very, very brutal. They intentionally instilled fear in the hearts of those they conquered, tried to do that with Hezekiah, as you'll see in just a moment, to cause other countries to surrender and, uh, instead of fighting. But in 701 B.C., these Assyrians, headed by King Sennacherib, invaded Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, because of their disobedience to God. So here's the setting as we get to Hezekiah. According to an Assyrian monument of steel, Found in the ruins of the royal palace in Nineveh, Sennacherib conquered 46 cities, conquered them in Judah prior to attempting to conquer Jerusalem. He did not conquer. He besieged. He did not conquer Jerusalem. Remember this morning we said Jerusalem sits on three hills. God allowed most of Judah to be conquered, but protected Jerusalem. Why? Because of the obedience of Hezekiah. As Hezekiah began to prepare, what he knew would be a very, very terrible siege by a merciless Assyrian war machine, he had to figure out how to protect his people. This meant building some defenses. And during the time of Hezekiah, Jerusalem's kind of urban population had grown 
far outside those old city walls of the city and were unprotected. King Hezekiah fortified it, the existing walls of the city and he built a new wall in a rapid manner to protect those living outside the city walls. In, in, in Chronicles 30, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 5, the Bible says, he set to work. He set to work um, and, and, and built up the wall that was broken down, raised towers upon it, or lookouts, and outside of it, he built another wall, and he strengthened it in the Milo, or this is the city of David that uh, we'll talk about in other sessions. He also made weapons and shields uh, in abundance. Hezekiah's wall measured 22 feet wide, 25 feet high. It was a massive undertaking. I'm going to show you that wall, the remains of it shortly, and measured around two and a half miles in length. Now, Jerusalem was much smaller there than it is now. A portion of the wall, of course, was discovered in the 70s by an Israeli archaeologist, dated it to the reign of King Hezekiah, 716 to 687 B.C. It was called Hezekiah's Broad Wall by archaeologists because it was so wide. Now, King Hezekiah also built a water tunnel in order to keep the water from the Gilead Spring inside the city walls so the Assyrians could not cut off the water supply. 32, chapter 32 of 2 Chronicles, verses 3 and 4. Even to this day, to my knowledge, Jerusalem has no water source inside the city. It has to bring it from the outside uh, of the city. And that's what Hezekiah had to do. If you're going to survive anywhere in this world, you've got to have water. Plain as day. Now this tunnel that Hezekiah built, he knew that Sennacherib was coming. He knew he was bringing uh, thousands of soldiers to take Jerusalem. He'd already conquered and burned and destroyed 46 cities of Judah, including Beth Shemesh that we talked about this morning, where I've had the pleasure of digging before, 30 days at a time on six different occasions, 12 miles south and a little west of Jerusalem. It's in the middle part of the country called the Shephelah. The Old Testament talks about it. It's not in the Judean hills. It's not on the side of, of the Mediterranean, the coastal side. It's right in the middle part of the country, the most fertile part of the country. So anyway, this tunnel is 583 yards long. It was about, in fact, it is about the length of six football fields. And it curves... You'll see a picture of this in just a moment. And it took the water from that Gilead spring under the mountain to the pool of Siloam, below the city of David. When you go to Jerusalem, when you go to a lot of places in Israel, Israel is only about the size of New Jersey. You can fit the whole city inside Lake Michigan. It's not that big at all. You can go from one biblical site to another in just a short period of time. You can go from one Old Testament site to a New Testament site in just a short period of time. And that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. King Hezekiah's father, Hazza, was a wicked king. He closed the doors to the temple. He burnt his children in sacrificial worship to false gods. King Hezekiah was a godly king who reopened the temple and restored worship to God. Read that in 2 Kings beginning in chapter 18. King Hezekiah chose not to serve the king of Assyria. 2 Kings 18, 7. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, conquered the southern part of Judah, including the mighty city of Lachish. Lachish lies uh, further south, about eight or nine miles south of Beth Shemesh. King Hezekiah tries to keep him at bay by paying him some money. You read that in 2 Kings 18, 13 through 16. Lachish, you'll see a picture of that in a moment. That's where he had his army. 185,000 soldiers. King Hezekiah makes plans to conquer Jerusalem. 2 Kings 18, 17. King Hezekiah mocks 
King Hezekiah, excuse me, King Sennacherib mocks King Hezekiah and the God of Israel. Also in 2 Kings 18, King Hezekiah humbles himself before God and sends for a prophet. The prophet in Jerusalem at this time is Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet is in Jerusalem now. You'll look at some charts, you read the Bible, you'll see that uh, Isaiah was also the prophet for other individuals as well. But he's in, Israel, he's in Jerusalem with Hezekiah in Jerusalem, and he is the prophet, 2 Kings 19, the first seven verses. So Sennacherib once again threatens King Hezekiah and speaks against the God of Israel. Hezekiah seeks the help of the Lord. God answers his prayer. Listen to 2 Kings 19, beginning in verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king of Israel, uh, the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there, and he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. That's how he conquered cities were siege ramps. You go to Masada. Look at that siege. Now, Masada is not mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned as a fortress. Which we believe that is the same. That's what King Herod, the, the, the king that um, that killed all the babies, the king that was uh, alive when uh, Jesus came into the world, was born. He built a siege ramp up the side of Masada to get to it. So, uh, Sennacherib builds a siege ramp, a ramp going up to uh, the top of, of Lachish so he can get in there and take that city, and he did. So he builds a siege ramp. But uh, he wasn't going to be able to do that, God says, in Jerusalem. Verse 33, by the way that he came, by the same he will return, God said. And he shall not come to this city, declares the Lord. Verse 34, for I, have, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. God's miraculous is going to destroy King Sennacherib. And his army. 2 Kings 19 35. So now we have the setting here. Now we have what's going to be happening. So, what kind of faith lessons can we learn from this? Even though Hezekiah had a wicked father, Hezekiah chose not to serve the evil, he chose to serve God. King Hezekiah was a good king. I'm going to show you how good he was in just a moment. No matter what our background, no matter what your background may be, and the parents that we have, or the relatives that we have, we can, God can still use you and me greatly, and He and we can yield a lot of good things for God, for Him. Hezekiah was dedicated, extremely dedicated to God. Listen to what 2 Kings 18, 5, beginning says. He trusted the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, none among those who were before him. Listen to verse 6. For he clung to the, clung to the Lord. Clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. He kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. He trusted God in doing great things. He trusted God in trials. And believe me, this is a trial coming. Hezekiah, Isaiah, and the people of Judah, they're in Jerusalem. You've got an army of 185,000 out there that wants to take and destroy you, just like they did the 46 cities of Judah. God blessed him, protected him because of his faith. Dedication to him. He worked hard to fortify those old walls, to build a huge new wall, and protected the water source of the city. He had to do that for fortification. All this was good, but not needed as God supernaturally protected Jerusalem because Hezekiah trusted God. King Hezekiah lived the kind of life God blesses. Are we following that example? Now, 2 Kings 18, 4, he, Hezekiah, removed the high place 
and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. I'll tell you what that is in the next lessons or so. Asherah is a Canaanite fertility goddesses that uh, even Judah began to worship. But he broke those things down. He desecrated those pagan uh, temples. He desecrated those, those cult ritual sites and um, broke them into pieces. Remember the bronze servant, a serpent that Moses had made for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. Now, here's there are some pictures here I want to begin with. All right. This is what the serpent that Moses, a drawing of the serpent on the pole. You remember that story. Um, this term is uh, that you see there is, is a proper noun coming from either the word snake or brass, and it means the great serpent or the great brass. Something else that Hezekiah did. He desecrated those pagan ritual uh, temples and cult sites where the Canaanites uh, and, and, uh, and others worshipped their gods. This happens to be at Lachish. I've had the privilege of being there about three times at Lachish. Um, it's an interesting site. We'll get into all the details now. But this, brothers and sisters, is a toilet. A toilet. This is what they had. This is what Hezekiah put in the middle of that Canaanite worship shrine. He desecrated it. That's a pretty good way of desecrating a crazy thing, isn't it? Here they are pulling it out. Archaeologists take several. That's made of concrete, uh, plaster. They're pulling that toilet out of that area. He didn't walk in and just burn it or knock it down. He just put a toilet in the middle of it. That's a pretty good way to desecrate. That's what Hezekiah did. He hated those things. Did a good job. Now, according to 2 Chronicles 32, Verse 2 and 2 Kings 20 20, Hezekiah knew he had to get water inside the city of Jerusalem. So a tunnel was dug during the reign of King Hezekiah of Jerusalem, of Judah, uh, to prepare Jerusalem for the attack that's coming from this Assyrian king, Sennacherib. In the Bible, it says that Hezekiah redirected the water through old and newly dug Jerusalem. Tunnels. Now, in this map, that's going to be kind of hard to see, but let me point out. Whoops, that's not what I want. Let me point out Jerusalem right here. Right there's Jerusalem. This is the Dead Sea. This is the Jordan River that meanders downward. This is the Sea of Geneva or the Sea of Galilee. If you go on up here to Dan. Mount Hermon, there are three springs at Mount, at Mount Hermon that all come together to form the uh, Jordan River. And it meanders down. Now, we'll see, see some pictures. Jordan River, in some places, is just a little wider than this eye. Not near as wide like it was in the days of the Old Testament of Christ. So here you have Jerusalem. Here you have Beersheba, south into the Gap. Here you have Gath, Gaza. Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, those, one, two, three, four, five, those are the five cities of the Philistines. So you kind of get an area of where we're at here. Lachish is right here. Jerusalem, Lachish. And right about in here, right about there is where that Shemesh is. And you have, of course, the Mediterranean River over here, Judean Hills, and then, of course, Jordan on the other side. So in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 30, the same Hezekiah also stopped up um, upper water courses, uh, waterways of Gilead Spring, and brought in straight down to the west side of the city of David. The rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his might, the Bible says, and how he made a pool, a conduit, and brought water into the city 
are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now, 2 Chronicles 32, verses 2 through 7. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and intended to fight against Jerusalem, he planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. A great many people were gathered, and they stopped, the Bible says, all the springs and the brook that flowed toward uh, through the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? Let him find his own water. We need this water to survive. He set to work, he built the walls, and he brought the water into the city. Verse 7, be courageous, be strong. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria, God says, and all the horde that is with him, for there is for there are more with us than with him. You and I and God form a majority. Period. So God says, verse 8, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God. That's what this God says. So here we go. The Bible records that prior to the Assyrian invasion of Judah, 701 BC, King Hezekiah built a tunnel under the city of David to bring water in to this area. It was discovered in 1867, by the way. 2 Kings 18, the tunnel was built to transport, bring the water in from the outside. They camouflaged the spring from the outside. And you know where it ends up? When you go through that tunnel, which is this wide, elbow to elbow, it's not very wide. 600 yard long, yards long, makes a couple of curves, and it comes out at the Pool of Siloam. <coughs> pool of Siloam. It's where Jesus had put mud and spittle on the blind man's eyes, told him to go wash in the Pool of Siloam. So you're in an Old Testament tunnel and you come out to a New Testament site. This is a picture of, you can see here a little bit, of the city of David that they're still excavating. Here's Hezekiah's tunnel beginning up here. The Gilead Spring comes down, makes a point right here, comes down, makes another curve, and ends at the Pool of Siloam. This is a meeting point. It's the middle. They started at each end. Not with jackhammers, not with any machinery, but with pickaxes. And coming together, listening to what's going on, listening to those sounds of the pickaxes, and meeting in the <coughs> middle. They came very close, to almost like this. They were a little off, but then they made a short curve and connected. One of the greatest, one of the greatest engineering feats of all time. When you go to Israel, you've got to go through the tunnel. But when you start, you can't turn around and go back. Because if you can turn around, depends on if you've got a backpack on or, or some kind of a little fanny pack around your waist, you turn around, well, there's another tour group behind you. It may be 25 or 30 people. Well, you're not going through them. So you make a commitment. There's a sign that says, in English, in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, not biblical. Biblical Hebrew didn't have the Bibles. Modern Hebrew or um, uh, um, uh, the uh, Aramaic. Thank you, Marjorie. Aramaic. If you're claustrophobic, don't try it. You'll go crazy. Well, this is where we start, right here. You wear some good shoes with grip. Yeah, roll those pant legs up because water's going to come up around your thighs. About 53 degrees in there, water wise. And it's as dark as dark can be. So wear you one of those uh, flashlight hats on your head or, or bring one like this when you go through. So there you go. You're going to start and you're going to go all the way to the end and come down into the tunnel. And you're going to walk down those stairs. Remember, whenever you go in Israel, you're going to walk, you're going to walk, and you're going to walk. Because those biblical sites don't have escalators or elevators. And if you go down a hundred stairs into a cistern where they collect thousands of gallons of water that are dry now, then you're going to walk a hundred steps back up. Period. Take your water bottle. 
So, Hezekiah's tongue. There you go. It's as low as five feet and almost as high as 18 to 20 feet. Sometimes like we could stand up, couldn't even touch the top. Other times you had to bend over. So these individuals are going through backpack on. This is Dr. Culberson from Hoover, Alabama, outside Birmingham. And as you can see, you see these water lines where it once was on both sides. But you know, he's, he's wet above his knees and he's going through and he's got a flashlight on the top of his head. And I'm following Jerry. Here's some other students going through. Any volunteers to go to Hezekiah's Tunnel? Yes. All right, young man. Good for you. You'll enjoy it. Here's a young lady standing there um, about to go through Hezekiah's Tunnel. This is what it looks like as you go through. It's not very wide, but it brought water in for Hezekiah and for the people in Jerusalem so they could survive the attack. So there's a long shot of it right there. All the way in. The water came up to almost my thigh in certain parts, usually around my knees or so. And it's cool. And the surface is kind of shaky, so you got to wear some good shoes, obviously. And toward the end of the tunnel, there is a, there is a plaque telling, written in a uh, uh, biblical Hebrew, telling about the, the tunnel and the excavation of it and, and the meeting of the men in the middle. Now, this is a replica. The original one was removed, and it is in the museum, um, I believe, in, um, in Israel. So they recorded that. So while the workmen are still lifting up the pack axe or pickaxe, each toward his neighbor, and while three cubits yet remain to be cut through, each heard the voice of the other, calling to his neighbor. For there was an express an excess in the rock on the right, and on the day of the breaking through, the excavators struck each to meet the other, and they met together. Second Chronicles 32, the first five verses. After these things, and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib king of Assyria came and entered into Judah. Camp, of course, there at Lachish. And of course, he gathered his army. He sent in to Jerusalem his negotiators, or Rakshashai, is what the Bible says. They communicated and tried to make a deal with Hezekiah. Hezekiah gave them some of the very expensive uh, ornaments and the silver and the gold out of the temple. Take this and go away. They took it, but they didn't go away. And, and you know the story. So they, they tried to negotiate with Hezekiah. Hezekiah would have none of it. He says, no, I'm not going to do anything. Except, I'm going to take the advice of Isaiah. Isaiah said, listen, Hezekiah, go to God in prayer tonight. Pray to the God of heaven, Hezekiah, that Sennacherib and his army will not invade Jerusalem. Sets on three hills. It's hard to invade. Go back to the Six Day War in 67 and see how hard it was for, for, the, for, the, for all the soldiers to get up there and fight. Hezekiah prays. The next morning, he wakes up. 185 soldiers of Sennacherib lay dead on the ground. What in the world is Hezekiah going to do? Well, this is where he's located at uh, Lachish. Part of his army had already moved from here up to a place called Libna, which is about halfway between Lachish and Jerusalem. Small area. They're, they're excavating there now. Hezekiah packs his bag, uh, uh, Sennacherib packs his bags, and he goes back to Nineveh. He goes back to Nineveh. Hezekiah prayed to God the advice of Isaiah, 185,000 soldiers are dead. Sennacherib packs his bag, goes back to Nineveh, and within three years, he has three sons, and within three years, sons kill him. He's done with it. He did not conquer Jerusalem. He besieged it. He's sitting here at Lachish. Nice area. Go to Lachish, you'll stand up there, and, and uh, this is the spring of the year when when it was very green. 
You'll stand up there and you'll look out. What do you see? You'll see groves and groves and vines, all grapes. I personally believe this is south. I think it was this area in which God, or excuse me, uh, uh, Moses sent in some of the spies to spy out the land. Uh, because they came back, remember, with a big vine of grapes on their shoulders. And this is an area in Israel where they grow a lot of grapes. So possibly it could have been the same area. Talk about a siege ramp. That's what he built. Hezekiah built that siege ramp. And that's a lot of rock. That's a lot of work for his soldiers to get up there. When you go to, La uh, to Lachish, you walk up this area. Now, this is an old picture. Now they have a, a real pretty rail walkway with, with metal steps going up. But notice up here, this is where you've got to go in. You've got to go in this way, and you've got to make a right-hand turn. And then, and then you've got three, of course, um, uh, gates there. That's that's what Solomon built. Solomon was famous at Megiddo, at Lachish, and other places, of building three uh, chamber gates so that when you go into Lachish, you've got to turn. When you've got your shield in one hand, you've got your sword in the other. So it's going to be hard and difficult when you turn to fight. That's the reason they built it that way. And you've got three gates to go through as well. Here is old Sennacherib. This is one of his, the reliefs that is on his mural that he built when he got back to, of course, uh, Nineveh. Sargon II was the father of Sennacherib. Read about that in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. Here you have on the relief of uh, men being impaled. On uh, that's, how, that's how cruel the Assyrians were. This is, what, this is how Sennacherib re recorded his, his uh, exploits and his wars and so forth. And here they are in the museum. You can go take a look. They removed them from Nineveh, put them in the, I believe this is the British Museum. And here you have the archers with the arrows ready to go. And here you have the, the uh, spearmen with the spears ready to go. And here you have a picture of, of the chariot, part of the chariot. Uh, as they're charging. And here you have uh, the slaves here, and of course the bodies of individuals that they're uh, mutilating down here. Up here you have the chariots. This is, what he, this is how he recorded all of his exploits. And here he is on his chariot, headed in this direction. Horses, reins, and old king Sennacherib. And then of course here you have uh, the uh, spearmen a little close-up, and the shields. Here's a picture of, of um, well, that's exactly, those are sling stones. Did we talk about them in class this morning? Remember, Israeli and Palestinian boys make the slings out of twine and sell them over there. King, king David, well, David, prior to being king, killed Goliath with something similar to this. And the sling stones, about as big as baseballs, you know, 30 to 40 yards apart from that they estimate from Goliath, hit him in the forehead and dropped him dead. So that's the story of King Hezekiah. Power in prayer, brothers and sisters. He prayed to God. Do we counsel God before we do anything? Do we pray to, you know, we worry about this, and I can name a list of things we worry about, concern, but we need to pray to God about these things. What about decisions that you make? Pray to God. Think about these things. And then, of course, at the end of that, that tunnel, you come out, of course, at the pool of Siloam. And this is part of the pictures of the pool, another close-up. Not much there because part of it runs under a Greek Orthodox church, and you're not going to uh, excavate under that building, of course. And you'll notice the stairwell going up. You've got to go up about 80 steps to get to the street level up there because you're down below. So that's the pool of Siloam. Old Testament into a New Testament site. And as we close, I want to show you this. This is a bulla. This is a bulla. This is a bulla of King, uh, excuse me, of uh, Isaiah. 
This is Dr. Mazar. Remember this morning, I told you she digs with the Bible in one hand and the, the uh, petition that you'll see later on, digging tools in the, in the other. There she has that bulla that she's discovered. This is the bulla or seal. These are seals of, that's the one of King Hezekiah. She found them 10 feet apart right outside the walls of old Jerusalem. So, Hezekiah really lived. Isaiah really lived. And I know that for a fact because I read it in the Bible. Circular archaeologists have to find these things in order to believe these things. And here they are together. Hezekiah on the left, Isaiah on the right. These were their seals that they would use to seal correspondence and so forth. And, and uh, seal their uh, showing that it came from them. So, Hezekiah protected his city with a wall. Here's a picture of the exposed part of the wall. When you uh, look at the city of walls uh, of Hezekiah that he built, the Gilead Springs, Hezekiah's tunnel right here in the blue, Pool of Siloam here, the temple up here, Temple Mount, and this part right here is the exposed wall that they've discovered. This is Hezekiah's broad wall as we close this part of the lesson. This was taken in 06, my first trip uh, to Israel. It is a broad wall. And that's the only part they've ever uh, discovered. But you can see how broad it is. It was high, of course, as we talked about uh, earlier. Now, the scripture that was read this morning by the good brother is a scripture I wanted to read because of its importance. Listen carefully. Here you have the story we all know of the prodigal son. He goes into a foreign land. Give me what I have. Give me my inheritance. So he gets his inheritance, gets his money. You know the story. There in Luke 15. And he goes, squanders it away. He doesn't, he doesn't have any more friends because he doesn't have any more money. He was living a good life, living it up. Had a lot of friends because he had money. Now no money, no friends. So what's he going to do to survive? Came from a good life, came from a good family, had a brother at home, had a good father at home, but now he's out by himself. And he needs food. And he needs a job. So he gets a job feeding the pigs, feeding the swine. What's he feeding them? He's feeding them these things. Hear the seeds inside, maybe? Hear the seeds? They're hard. These uh, pods here are the uh, carob pods from the carob tree. Southern Israel, find lots of them. Just go up and pick what you want. And that's what we did. Pick fistfuls of them. He was eating this husk and eating the, the seeds inside, which, by the way, are related to chocolate, but they don't taste like chocolate. They're quite bitter. So he's, re he's so I, I, you know, I, I'm hungry. So I'm feeding the pigs. These pods, these carrot pods, seeds, and I'm going to eat them too. So he eats them. Comes to his senses. Goes back to his father. I came from a good life. I squandered my money. Now look where I am. I'm eating this garbage that is fed to the hogs and the pigs. Came to his senses and went back home. Many times we in this life, of course, we in this life come to our senses. We squander things maybe. I want to make my own decision, mom, dad. They're not good decisions. We didn't counsel God. Or we adults say, well, you know, if I can go over here and do a little bit of this, look at all the good things I've done on this side. God's going to excuse me because of it. How do you know that? He didn't excuse the people back in the days of Noah like that. Read about that in the book of Peter. So here, maybe these represent a life that we got involved with. A, no, a dead end, let's say. Nowhere to go. No friends. And now we come to our senses. We often leave the Lord. The Lord's always there. 
What about your life? Has it been in shambles? Has it been to the point of, hey, I've got to change. I can't keep doing all of this and trying to be religious a few times a week in this building. You can't live a life like that. You either serve God or you don't serve. Are you baptized into Christ? Have you had the remission of your sins? Just as his father waited at the door, saw him coming afar off, had his arms outstretched and said, come home, son. Jesus says, come home. Come home before it's too late. Give up this life. Give up those worries. Give up that mess. Give up what the world offers. And let's focus and concentrate on the Lord. Whether you've been unfaithful, whether you haven't named the name of Christ, examine yourself now before it is too. We may not be back at 5 o'clock today. I've got other things I want to show you from our theology and other stories and other lessons and so forth. We're going to talk about the illegal trial of Jesus. We're going to talk about Rahab and rehab. We're going to talk about some other things. We may not be able to Lord comes again. And he's coming back. We don't know when. What's your life like? God says, come. I'm here for you. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please stand as we sing the invitation song. I hear the voice of Jesus say, come on to me and rest. Lay down the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made so very much for being here. Ferris, thank you for a wonderful lesson. Deeply, deeply appreciate that so much. There is a fellowship meal. If you are visiting with us, we are honored that you are here this morning, and we, we ask that you can stay and share this meal with us. Uh, the ladies will be a few minutes getting everything prepared and on the tables, but you're welcome to be here in fellowship with us a little bit longer. And uh, we'll meet again here tomorrow, tonight, I'm sorry, 5 o'clock. Man, don't cut me short. I, no, no, I don't dare cut you short, brother. Uh, never do that to you. You know where I live. Uh, but we're just grateful so much for you uh, being here this evening. Um, at this time, we'll be dismissed with a prayer, and, and we're thankful for everybody.
our most gracious and almighty Heavenly Father. We're so thankful for all the many blessings of life that you've given to us. Father, we're so thankful for each and every person here today that you bless each one, Father. Be with all the ones that have been mentioned this morning. Be with the ones that are in the bulletin that are in need of help. We pray, Father, that you bless them. Bless them and bring them back to good health in thy way. Father, we pray for our country. We pray, Father, that uh, the, the leaders of our country would, would, would make the right decisions that they will make that uh, help America be American again. We're truly thankful, Father, for the gospel meeting this week. We're so thankful for our brother of Iris and Marjorie for being here with us and uh, being here with us until Tuesday evening, I guess. And we pray, Father, that you bless them and comfort them and, and give them a safe trip back to our homes. And we pray, Father, as we uh, leave the building today that we will uh, be okay and that uh, we can be coming back at 5 o'clock today. Father, we're so thankful for each and every one here this morning. Especially the, the preachers and the school teachers. We pray for all of them, Father. We're so thankful for them. And, uh, be with us, Father. We thank you for all things. We pray, Father, in you. We pray thy will that everything that we pray for today that will be okay. Ask all these things, Father, be in thy will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.